thanks a lot, Dina, for giving me a, a chance to show you guys what we're up to at the uh, at the APS. So uh, uh, this beamline uh, started to be developed when the uh, the MBA uh, upgrade to the APS was announced in about 2015. And, uh, and actually most of the proposal was written by Ian McNulty and I when he was still at the APS. And, uh, and this is sort of the, the extended list of contributors to the original science proposal uh, that formed the, the basis for the beam line. Uh, these days, actually I wanted to point this out too. So this is kind of a good example of, of what we're gonna be able to do at a new beam line. So this is a data set measured at, at 34 IDC at the APS. And, and the nice thing about this is that the, the crystal size was very well matched to our X-ray spot size. And so we, uh, we measured this data set in about 25 minutes at, at 34 IDC. And, and this is a, you know, a little gold crystal in the beam. You know, this corresponds to like a 15 second measurement at the, at the upgrade beam line. Um, so, you know, it's gonna be a little bit of a horrifying uh, flood of data that's gonna come out of this thing. Um, I don't might come out of this thing, assuming it works. Uh, this is the people that are sort of involved in the day-to-day -day development of the beamline now. Uh, Winsuk, Jorg, and I are, are the people that come up with the, the dumb ideas. The engineering team is the, the group that, you know, kind of looks at us cross-eyed and says, well, maybe. And, uh, and then the optics team is, is by far the, the most productive um, in, in recent time. And, and it's being led by Shambo Shi. He's been developing the optical systems for, for all of the upgrade beam lines. And, and he's ridiculously productive. I, I got to admit that probably a third, maybe a half of what I'm going to show you guys today is a direct result of, of his work. So, um, so he's been extremely, extremely productive. Um, so this is the kind of work we're doing today. And, and I think people are familiar with, uh, with these types of experiments. We're doing a sort of operando nanoscale imaging. Um, we're, we're doing it at 34 IDC. And the reason that we can sort of, you know, do these kinds of experiments is that we, we actually don't, we don't try very hard at the beam line. We have very modest optics. Um, the advantage is we have a dedicated instrument. We very seldom take anything apart or, uh, or change anything. Um, and, and we can focus on sort of, you know, high Z materials where you get a good signal. Uh, we look at samples that are sort of compatible with our spot sizes. Our, our spot is sort of a half micron on a good day. Um, so, you know, three and 400 nanometer, you know, gold and platinum and, and battery particles fit pretty well in that beam. Um, and, and we're also looking at dynamics that are very compatible with our measurement time. So like, you know, 10 to 20 minute measurements and, uh, you know, things happening in crystals on the 10 to 20 nanominute uh, or 10 to 20 minute uh, time scale. Um, are the types of experiments you, you can really you can really do well at, at our beamline. Um, but we, we started forming a beamline proposal back in 2015 or 16 to uh, start you know maybe pushing this a little bit further. Um, and the idea was to start looking at things where the sort of nanoscale and sub nanoscale becomes, uh, you know, the dominating uh, sort of structural uh, characteristics and, and trying to image those things at, at those resolutions. And, and our science case was built around these sort of topics. Um, this was a contribution from David Teedy in our chemistry division, where he's, he's looking at these or, or growing these uh, um, synthetic leaf uh, materials is what he calls them. So they're basically materials that'll split water into hydrogen and oxygen with just the input of sunlight. And, uh, and these things are very efficient, but they don't really have um, a, good, a good grasp of the sort of structural characteristics of the active components in these materials. And, and at the time, there were some questions about what, how these layered materials stacked up and, and sort of what sort of defects appeared in these layers. Um, they actually did answer this question recently. There was a paper published uh, last year where they finally were able to untangle the sort of structure of these, these layered oxides that form these artificial leaves. Um, you know, we're looking at a lot of catalysis experiments at the beam line even today. And, and you can start zooming in at, on the sort of nanoscale and looking at actual active catalytic sites on, on even smaller objects and, and imaging the, uh, the response of these catalysis crystals to, uh, to, to the, you know, the input reactants. Um, you can start looking at structural materials and trying to correlate uh, strain imaged in one way with defects um, on grain boundaries. Um, 
um, all, all at the same time, if you can start to image on the nanoscale. Um, and then also uh, metallic glasses were a, were a topic that one of our contributors brought up. Um, you know, these things are extremely strong and when they fail, they, they fail catastrophically. And those failures are, are the sort of collective motions of, of groups of atoms. And if you could try to understand how, uh, how these atoms start to move around uh, before and after failure, um, you could start to have some impact on the actual application of, of, of these types of uh, materials. So this was sort of the science case that we developed, um, th these types of ideas, and, uh, and it led to the, the sort of guiding force of, of the beamline specification. Um, my uh, screen is moving extremely slowly. Let me see if I can solve that problem really quickly. Um, and this is supposed to be up here. There we go. Um, so we came up with this kind of specification for the for the beam line. Um, this is our, our, our basically our advertising slide when we uh, when we first finished the proposal to try to, to, to get the beam line uh, get the beam line sort of built. Um, we had this idea that we would work in the sort of five to 25 kilovolt range um, um, because that sort of hits a, a lot of capabilities as far as penetration and, and high scattering at lower energy. Um, we, we live currently at a, at a beam line with a, a canted sector and we have a Lowy diffraction microscope um, as our, our partner at the beam line. So, so we've kind of had this thinking for the last you know, 20 years that being able to switch the beam from pink beam to mono beam and do Lowy diffraction microscopy is a very clever way to get orientation of crystalline lattices. And so we actually started developing that um, with a partner user proposal at Los Alamos and Brigham Young and Carnegie Mellon University in the last few years to, uh, to have a removable monochromator that we could pull out of the beam and do Lowy diffraction on a, on a small crystal and get an orientation matrix from it and use that to then go dial up Bragg peaks um, with a monochromatic beam and do coherent diffraction on them. Uh, um, Tassos, Anastasios, Pateras uh, published this paper last year where we, we showed that we could do this in situ with this, uh, this monochromator that now actually exists at 34 ID. Um, so that's still one of our, our sort of driving goals in the, the development of the beam line is this ability to, to switch between pink and mono beams. Um, we also wanted to include a, a, a zoomable uh, uh, focusing system into the beam line uh, with this idea that we'd be able to change the spot size from sort of 50 nanometer scale to a, a couple of micrometer scale um, without moving the, the position of that focus. And, and I'm going to talk a lot about this, uh, this sort of technological development that we've been working on for, for the last few years at, at APS. Um, in the next few slides. Um, and then this was our selling point that we we're going to deliver extremely high resolution imaging, sort of reaching the nanometer scale uh, via coherent diffraction. We were also going to maintain this ability to do operando and in situ experiments um, with very high resolution imaging. And our goal was to have a, a sort of five centimeter working distance in our focusing optics. Um, and so so that gives us space for doing, doing in situ types of experiments. Um, so these have been our sort of motivating goals um, in the, the development of the beam line. And, and we're sort of sticking to these, these goals uh, reasonably well. Um, I wanted to show a little bit, I can't believe how slow my screen is going, show a little bit about some simulations I've been doing in the, the last couple of months to uh, try to understand the type of data that we'd be able to measure. Um, assuming we can, uh, you know, put the, the photons on the sample and collect them. Um, I've been working with some atomistic models that we can, uh, we can generate and relax with molecular dynamics. And then I can just do the lattice sum on these atomistic models and, and form uh, diffraction patterns like this. Um, and so I started getting asked questions by our engineering group. You know, if, if you have this huge detector that's say 4K by 4K, um, can you actually get a signal across that whole detector? And, and well, that's an important question to answer. Um, so I started running these simulations, again, just using PyNix from, from Vincent at DSRF. Um, summing these, these atomistic models, and then just doing the, the sort of Thompson scattering correction. So nothing too sophisticated, just, you know, using E and M and H and, and C and, uh, and uh, 
and just rescaling to get a sense of what kind of photon flux we would have um, in, in the diffraction patterns from, from such a little crystal. And, and it was actually surprising how, how, how full the detector was with signal. So, so I was uh, simulating here from, so this is a crystal where the C axis is pointing up and I was simulating here from L equals 1.5 to 4.5 and, uh, and just doing a, you know, a, 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 I was uh, using extra utilities then to, to use sort of a realistic detector geometry. And, and I was just simulating the HKL values for each frame. And, uh, and looking at what the intensity was across the detector as a function of this, uh, this scan from, from one point in reciprocal space to the other. And, uh, and it was kind of surprising. So, so in the 002 Bragg peak, which is the first one here, um, you get about 2 million photons per second. The 004 is coming out to about 0.5 million photons per second. And all the way out to the edge of the detector here, these brighter signals are, are sort of, you know, 10, 20, 30, 50 photons per second out on the edge of the detector. So it seems like, you know, this is just a 50 second simulation in, in the upgrade, um, assuming we get about 10 to the 12 photons per second on the sample. Um, you know, it seems like this this becomes a, a fairly reasonable kind of data set to expect. Um, of course, you know, it, it won't be exactly this because I'm not including everything, but but at least it's an estimate of the type of signal we would see. Um, so, so it's really looking encouraging that, you know, at least with a radiation hard sample that could handle this type of dose that we'll be able to uh, measure sort of really extensive volumes of reciprocal space. And we've just started wondering how you phase something like this. And then what that image even means um, is even a question. I wanted to put a little plug in for this, uh, this website that's been developed by a graduate student at the University of Illinois in, in Chicago, Will Judge. Um, he, he's been developing a really nice set of instructions for how to put together an atomistic model and how to use PyNix to generate a, a coherent diffraction pattern from it. And he's even now starting to include documentation for using LAMPS, which is a molecular dynamics simulation package to actually relax this thing using a, an interatomic potential and get sort of a realistic um, sort of strain profile inside of the, the little crystal. Um, so, so go to these, uh, go to this documentation and take a look at it. It's, it's, it's you know, even I can follow the steps and 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 do this go from a, a little uh, you know crystal to a coherent diffraction pattern um, and I've been thinking about adding um, some instructions here for using extra utilities to simulate a, a sort of realistic diffractometer and then uh, and then maybe even include a module for doing the uh, the Thompson scattering and could even start to include you know other other uh, simulation modes. Uh, so a little bit back to the beam line now. Um, so, so here's the layout. So originally we had hoped that we could, we could have a, a green field where we would be alone and, uh, and we could really do a, a beam line with no compromises. And we were immediately told you're gonna have to compromise. Um, so we're gonna be living again at sector 34 where we currently live. We're still going to be a canted sector. And so our, 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 our sister instrument, the Lowy Diffraction Microscope is being rebranded as 3DMN. And then we're going to be on, on the other branch and, and we're going to live down here um, at the end of the sector now. In, in the atomic beam line. Um, so our first compromise was we can only have one undulator. And so our undulator that we chose was a, a revolver. So we're going to have a, 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 you know, finally the APS upgrade is going to allow these revolvers that have been at uh, ESRF now for a very long time. Uh, the undulators we chose were a 2.5 centimeter period and a 2.1 centimeter period um, that will give us a, a sort of composite tuning curve that looks something like this across the, the entire bandwidth of the beam line. Um, so we'll probably spend most of our time, you know, in, 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 in this band between sort of 10 and, and 15 kilovolts, but, you know, you don't know where things are going to go. We might end up spending more time at, at much higher energy. Um, so we're going to have a, a mirror here, a white beam mirror that will give separation between the beam lines. And we'll have a monochromature, which is actually removable to allow the, the pink beam experiments. Uh, we're, we've been doing a ton of work on the development of the zoom optical system. And then we'll have our experimental instrumentation at the end. So I was going to go through these things a little bit and, uh, and show you where our current state is. Um, 
this is the, the floor plan. If you've ever been to 34 ID, this is uh, what it currently looks like on the top here. We do our experiments in the C station here where our diffractometer lives. Um, and then in the upgrade, we're gonna build a, a, new, uh, a new instrument enclosure at the end of the sector. And uh, our KB mirror systems, the Zoom KB system will then now start in the C station. And the first mirror pair will be there. The second mirror pair will be down at the experiment. Um, and then the C station is gonna turn into an optical enclosure. There'll be both monochromators in here for each of the branches. And like I said, our first KB mirror pair. And then our white beam mirror will be at um, nominally three milliradians and live up in the, the uh, A station here, the, the first enclosure. Um, so one of the first things we had to look at was this, uh, this idea of a removable monochromator. So, so this is the sort of, you know, schematic of the beam line. The white beam um, is reflected into a pink beam, comes out to the monochromator. We're going to have a very small offset of about a millimeter in this monochromator. And then we'll have our, our focusing optics at the end of the beam line. And then to do these Lowy diffraction experiments, we have to, to move the, the monochromator out of the beam. But that also then shifts the... Uh, shifts the optical axis of the beam. Um, so our solution to that was then just to have a specification for the white beam mirror that we would move it upstream and then move basically the pink beam axis into the zoom KB um, um, axis for, for the monochromatic beam. Um, so so this, uh, this additional motion was included in our statement of work for our white beam mirror. And I think we're very close to awarding a contract for the, the white beam mirror um, um, system here. And uh, and it, and it should be it should be uh, not so bad to 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 add this additional motion. Um, I think that was all I wanted to say about that. Um, the the way these this is currently done. So even at 34 IDC, where we now have a small offset um, uh, monochromator, we actually heat the second crystal. And so when you switch from white beam or from from monochromatic beam. To pink beam mode, you're basically using a different uh, a different source angle, and so by uh, by changing the uh, the angle of this uh, first crystal uh, by heating it, you actually kind of bring the monochromatic beam onto the same axis as the pink beam, and uh, and that's a trick that works when your monochromator is running at room temperature. But our uh, upgrade monos are looking like they're going to need uh, liquid nitrogen cooling, and so when the first crystal is so cold. Uh, the temperature difference required between the two crystals is, is actually quite large. And so we had to start giving up on this idea of, of heating the second crystal to maintain this optical axis. And, uh, and we switched to this idea of just moving the, the white beam mirror upstream to, to maintain the optical axis in, into the final focusing optics. Um, so the Zoom KB system was something that was uh, proposed in, in 2013 um, in this publication. And, and like I said, we started developing this, this sort of beamline concept in, in about 2015, 2016. And, uh, and by 2016, they had actually uh, demonstrated this at Osaka University um, with a, a bimorph mirror system. So, so the idea here is that you can, you can use two pairs of, uh, of mirrors, you can use two KB mirrors, and you can uh, make them deformable, and you can move this first focus forward and backward with these deformable mirrors. And, and as a result, you can change the, the effective numerical aperture of the, uh, of the mirror system. So, so if you want a large spot size, you deform the first mirror, you move the first focus close to the second mirror, and you get a, a very small numerical aperture out of the, the second mirror, so you get a large beam. And then if you want to make a smaller beam, you just deform the first mirror, you pull that first focus further away from the second mirror, you now start to increase the numerical aperture of the, of the second mirror, and you get a smaller spot. And if you, you tune this all up properly, you can do all this without moving the position of the, of the final focal spot. And so, so this was a really attractive idea to us. And, and so we started uh, including this in our, our beamline specification. And, uh, and then this was actually demonstrated in this paper in 2016, where they uh, used a pair of these deformable mirrors and, and in one dimension were able to, uh, to tune the spot size. Um, so this gives you a lot of capabilities. It allows you to sort of tune the spot size to the sample size for a sort of Bragg CDI experiment. It allows you to, 
tune the spot size for typography, um, sort of field of view experiments versus like imaging rate and resolution and damage. Um, this was something I, I proposed early on that you could also tune the transmission efficiency of the, the KV mirrors. So in this high NA um, mode, this high numerical aperture mode, you're effectively overfilling this uh, the second mirror. And so when you're working at, at lower X-ray energies, in principle, if this was a fully tunable system, you could increase the angle of the second mirror and you could retune the shape of it and, and increase the sort of you know, transmission uh, efficiency of the second mirror because you're not going to lose anything to the higher higher angle. Um, this was shot down pretty quickly by Shambo. He said that, that the ability to reach the, the types of uh, uh, curvatures you would need um, um, to, to change the uh, incidence angle of the second mirror set just wasn't going to uh, work. But one of my other uh, thoughts was we could also tune the working distance. If we've got this uh, sort of fully uh, tunable mirror system, I could move the, the, the mirror system further away from the center of the diffractometer uh, for an experiment where I needed a larger working distance. And that's only gonna be at the cost of the, the sort of smallest spot size you can get. And, and fortunately that idea stuck around and we're start, now starting to specify a, a Zoom KB system with a tunable working distance as well as a tunable spot size. Um, so I'll show you a little bit about uh, the, the current, uh, current uh, status of, of this design. Um, what's really allowed us to keep this sort of tunable working distance um, idea is a very recent development by Osaka University. It's a hybrid bimorph um, mirror system. So this is a mirror that's now uh, not only adjustable by piezo strips on the side of the mirror to tune the shape of it. It's also got an integrated bender system. So, so they can mechanically bend the system and then you can, uh, you can uh, do a very fine tuning of this, the shape of the mirror with this integrated piezo system. Um, so, so we're now starting to incorporate um, uh, these types of uh, mirrors into the Zoom system. And, uh, and we've got a bit of a collaboration going with Osaka and, and JTEC now to sort of characterize uh, mirrors like this. Um, oh yeah, I probably should have said that, that the point of these bimor systems is that what they are is it's a piezo uh, material that is bonded to the substrate, to the silicon substrate. And then you can apply a voltage um, to each of these electrodes and very very finely tune the, the surface shape of the mirror um, along the length of the mirror. And, uh, and uh, we actually have one of these at APS now and we've been playing with it for a couple of years and, and getting used to how it works. And, and I'll show you some of the results from that. Um, so let's get a little bit into the specification of this mirror system. So, so this is the sort of consequence of, uh, of going to a variable working distance mirror system. And, and the consequence, the, the main driving uh, difference here is that both of the uh, final focusing mirrors have to be this hybrid mirror design. So it's this hybrid bender and bimorph um, mirror. But if we have a fixed working distance, the only one that really needs to be a hybrid mirror is the first one. And the second one can actually just be a, a sort of regular bimorph. Um, and the the difference is, is that the regular bimorph is shorter. Um, it, uh, it, you don't need room for the bender, so it can, it can be a slightly shorter mirror. If you have to add a bender, the, the total mirror length grows by quite a lot. And uh, so as a result, all of the, the DMAGs change because this mirror is now longer and its distance from the first mirror is uh, greater. And so that has a, an impact on the smallest spot sizes you can get. Um, and I was actually quite surprised how much this changes as a function of X-ray energy. So it turns out now that with this uh, sort of variable working distance mirror, um, we can get down to around 50 nanometers at eight kilovolts or nine kilovolts, but it's at the cost of a lot of flux. Um, if we really wanna get back flux, um, we actually have to, to pay for that um, in, in, in minimum spot size. So to get the, the sort of incident flux up to around 10 to the 12 uh, uh, photons per second, uh, the spot size kind of grows to around 70 nanometers. And so we have this now, this sort of concept of the high flux condition and the sort of low flux condition. And, uh, and then at about 12 kilovolts, actually everything sort of levels out. We can now start to reach the sort of 50 nanometer spot size 
um, as a function of energy and, and maintain the sort of 10 to the 11, 10 to the 12 kind of photon fluxes onto the, uh, onto the sample. Um, so, so this was the trade-off between going with a fixed working distance or a variable working distance. And, and there's just something about this variable working distance that everybody thinks is really cool. So we've really decided to, to pursue this as the, uh, the sort of uh, you know, target spec for the, uh, for the beam line. Um, here's some of the technology development we've been doing in, in recent years to, uh, to, to, you know, sort of be able to do this and have some confidence that we're going to be able to do this. Um, we got an Argon um, LDRD uh, funded project um, in 2018 to develop the, uh, the capability of, of doing a, a zoom optic. And uh, at the same time that this LDRD was rewarded, this stands for Laboratory Directors R&D Project. Um, at the same time that this LDRD was awarded, there was a DOE funded project across multiple institutions to, to develop wavefront preserving mirrors. And the Argon contribution to this was a wavefront sensor. So they're able to image a wavefront um, to very high accuracy. And, and so now you can kind of see that this is all coming together, that we can actually you know, look at, a, at, at the wavefront coming off of a deformable mirror and tune that wavefront with a, a very high level of um, um, fidelity um, using these wavefront sensors. And they were developing both a transmission um, mode one and a diamond sort of beam splitter mode one. Um, this diamond beam splitter one has actually uh, been, I think, kind of abandoned because the, the phase structure introduced by the diamond was, was quite severe. But anyway, I'm going to show you a little bit about the, uh, the development of this, uh, this, mirror, um, this mirror development we've been doing in, under this LDRD. Um, at, at the same time that this LDRD was awarded, Deming Shu, who's one of our, our sort of uh, you know, extremely capable engineers at APS, was developing a, a bender system. Um, using his uh, little uh, constrained, constrained flexure uh, uh, benders here. So, so he had this idea that you could, you could actually uh, mount, these, uh, mount a mirror onto these constrained benders and then using two uh, motors on the end, you would be able to get a, a very high fidelity ellipse if you design this whole thing correctly. And, and, and that's actually what he was finding in FEA simulation that over 50% of the length of the mirror, the sort of middle portion here, you're getting a, a sort of five nanometer tolerance um, uh, on the ellipse, and that was just an FEA. And then over the, the entire length of the mirror, there was sort of a nine nanometer tolerance in, in a perfect ellipse if you, if you design this thing very carefully. Um, and so fortunately he had already done this design and it was basically sitting in the can waiting for a lot of money to be thrown at it to build it. And our LDRD project uh, got, got a surprisingly uh, healthy funding. And so, so we developed a, a system here that would not only have his um, constrained flexure uh, bending here, it would also have an array of capacitive sensors on the bottom of it that would actually be able to look at the, uh, the metrology or look at the shape of the mirror um, in, in real time. And, and allow us to then tune the shape of the mirror for a, 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 a Zoom KB system. And the idea was that we could use, use these types of mirrors as the first mirror pair, um, because you don't necessarily need a perfect first focus. You can deal with aberrations in this focus because you can correct it at the end with this very you know, high fidelity uh, bimorph system in, in the second, uh, second mirror pair. And so we went about uh, building this thing and this is what it ended up looking like. Um, so there's, there's the benders on the end, there's the mirror fly on the top, and then here's this array of capacitive sensors. I think there's 23 of them along the bottom of the mirror. And then there's one on each end looking at where the, the bender uh, sort of paddle is, the, 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 the position of this bender. Um, and actually this turned into a bit of an engineering project in its own right, because nobody had ever done a metal coating on both sides of a, of a flat, of a bender uh, mirror. Um, so the top uh, is coated in platinum and the bottom is coated in gold to ground the capacitive sensors. And, uh, and that, that even turned into a bit of an engineering project to develop the, uh, the holders for this mirror so that you could coat both sides um, and then actually have leads on the end so you could uh, attach the grounding wires. Um, 
after we uh, produced this thing, we took it to the, the, the metrology lab at APS and we used the long trace profilimeter to uh, now come up with a correlation between what the capacitive sensors on the back of the mirror were measuring and uh, what the actual optical surface uh, shape was. And, uh, and this allowed us to develop a calibration curve between the, the cap sensors and the, the optical surface. And, and so here's, a, here's our first measurement of this where we, we did the scans with the LTP and we read out the cap sensors. You can see a few of them were actually not working at the time. And, uh, and so we were able to develop this sort of calibration curve, um, knowing that if the, the cap sensors were reading out a given, uh, a given set, then we would have a given uh, uh, optical surface or a given surface profile. Um, it turns out we actually, uh, we actually did this wrong and it took us a while to realize that. Um, we didn't have the, uh, the amplifier set up correctly on the cap sensors. And so we didn't have the maximum sensitivity and it turned, um, turned into quite, a, quite a, a severe error in the calibration of these cap sensors. And we didn't know it at the time. And we just kept moving forward with uh, testing this thing. And uh, we were gonna go back and recalibrate these things right when the pandemic started and, and suddenly we weren't allowed to go to the lab. Um, so we took it to, to 1BM uh, to, to, to start uh, learning how to use the thing. Um, so here we have the, the bender mirror in a helium box. And then downstream of this, we have this uh, grading interferometer system to, to actually do the wavefront measurement. And, and here's, some, uh, here's some measurements that came out of this beam time. Um, so this wavefront is actually, this, uh, this wavefront measurement here is actually able to, uh, to give us the, the sort of response function of the, of the mirror. So we're able to see if we move, the, uh, if we move motor one, the, the one in blue here, if we move motor one um, a certain distance and bend the mirror a certain amount, this is the sort of change we get in the, uh, in the response of the wavefront to, to a, a single micron movement of that mirror. And so you can build up a whole series of these calibration curves for, for different positions of these two uh, pico motors that, that bend the mirror. And, uh, and develop this entire sort of table of response functions that can allow you to then tune any sort of shape that you want. Um, so we, we set about trying to tune one and, uh, and here's the sort of result of this. So, so we started out with a wavefront measurement like this, uh, the black curve, and then we adjusted the two, uh, two motors to, to try to get to a, a, a target wavefront um, measured in the in the wavefront sensor, and uh, and what we found was that we we measured this the sort of blue curve here or the red curve, and uh, and here's the prediction error. Um, so this is actually quite severe. This uh you know you can't deal with sort of twenty nanometer uh, or ten nanometer wavefront errors, and uh, and we weren't certain what was what was causing this until we started to realize that our our cap sensors were actually not well. Uh, not well calibrated and that ended up being the cause of these types of errors which are sort of endemic in all of our our work now um, on this system um, but uh, like i said we, we think we can fix this because we can do a better a better job of the, the calibration of the of the cap sensors. Um, Mashrafi uh, was a postdoc working with us on this project for, for about a year. And he said about playing with some machine learning for, uh, for being able to tune this. Because again, if you have a whole set of these calibration curves, um, for the wavefront to, uh, to motor uh, position, you now need to be able to, to predict what you need for, uh, for a given, uh, a given wavefront. And so he worked on a, a, a set here now where, where he did a, a bunch of measurements. So he read out the cap sensors for a whole bunch of different values of the, the force motors on the ends of the mo on, on the ends of the mirror, developed this whole uh, sort of tuning, uh, tuning set that he could then use to train a, a, a machine learning algorithm or a neural network. So you could feed in the cap sensor values or the mirror profile that you want and out would come the two values you need to set the, uh, the force motors to, um, to, uh, to get a specific um, or a specified uh, mirror shape. And he showed that this was actually producing a result that was again very similar to a a sort of a search algorithm or an interpolation algorithm from the from the, uh, the sort of composite uh, tuning curve set that we had. Um, so he was able to show that his neural network was producing very similar results. But again, this is 
very bad error because of our, our cap sensor calibration. So, so we anticipate that once we improve the, the cap sensor calibration, uh, both of these will be much more accurate. So for, we'll be able to say we need this shape of mirror and we'll be able to pull out you know, what you have to set the motors to to get that shape of mirror with a, a fairly high fidelity. Um, so that's the current state of, of the sort of uh, uh, bender system that we've been using and developing as our, our first mirror. Um, we, we've also spent a lot of time with this, uh, this bimorph. Um, this was bought under this, uh, again, this uh, sort of multi-institution uh, wavefront preserving mirror project. So it's actually been getting uh, quite a lot of use in, in, in these two different projects. Um, this is what the mirror looks like. There's the piezo with the electrodes on the edges there. It sits in this box that was delivered by JTEC. And then here's the electrodes that apply the voltage to the, uh, the individual, individual electrodes, and then there's the mirror surface. Um, so our plan for, for a mirror like this is, is um, we also want to be able to measure the in situ uh, sort of metrology. We want to be able to measure the shape of the mirror and, and ensure that we're tuning up the, uh, the shape that we need for, for a given spot size. And our, our plan here is to integrate a set of interferometers um, across the top of the mirror here to actually look at the optical surface of the, of the mirror. And, uh, and Deming had actually worked out an entire um, uh, mounting system for I think I think it was like nine or ten um, atto cube interferometers that would be uh, arrayed across the top surface to read out the uh, profile and all of that stuff was uh, was delivered uh, right when the pandemic started so we haven't even um, managed to, to do that mounting and test the system yet but anyway that's our plan for these uh, for these bimorphs is to look at the top surface then with, uh, with interferometers so that we can you know, do real sort of real time metrology and, uh, and maintain the shape that we need for a given, uh, a given focus. Um, so we did eventually get around to putting the two mirrors together and do a, a sort of 1D zoom demonstration. Um, this was how we worked. We first uh, put the, the bender into the beam and we use the interfer the wavefront sensor, the grading and detector system to, to tune up a, a set of shapes in the first mirror system. So, so that's uh, what you see here. We were optimizing the, the shape of the mirror to get as close to the ideal shape as we needed for a given spot size. And then, uh, and then we would uh, put the second mirror in this bimorph and then tune up the whole system. So we would then look at the, the, the focus or the beam coming off of both mirrors and, uh, and correct for a, a, given, uh, a given system and so, or a given uh, spot size. Um, and so, so this was actually kind of an iterative process because we haven't really gotten the whole, um, the whole sort of system working yet with uh, you know, being able to dial up a, a given shape on here due to our, our cap sensor calibration error. And we also don't have interferometry yet on the bimorph. Um, so we have to kind of, you know, play with the voltages on each of these piezos um, to, to get the, the shape that you want. Uh, this is a, a, a response function um, sort of set for the, the bimorph. Um, so this is essentially the exact same thing we did where we looked at the wavefront as a function of the bender motors on the, uh, on the bender motor. Um, but this is now as a function of the 18 different channels um, that you can apply voltages to on the bimorph. So you, you, you apply a voltage of a 100 volts to, to one electrode and you get the purple curve and the other electrode you get the orange curve. And so from this sort of set of uh, response functions, you can then form any, any mirror shape or any wavefront shape that you want. And, uh, and so we, we went through the sort of iterative process to, uh, to correct the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the wavefront coming into the, the second mirror and, and get a, a relatively optimal focus. Um, so, so that's actually kind of the neat thing about these bimorphs is that you, you really don't need a very good first focus because the bimorph can correct everything that's wrong with the wavefront coming into it. Um, so here's a, a little movie of the, the bimorph actually responding. So, so we, uh, we start with a, a you know, relatively flat uh, mirror and then we uh, put all the voltages onto all of the electrodes and you see this thing settle over the course of a, you know, sort of a minute or something like that to a, a relatively flat focus um, or a relatively decent focus. And so we did this for, uh, for three, different, uh, three different configurations. We got a relatively small spot of about three microns, 
Um, we were able to tune up a five micron focus and then about a 10 micron focus. And, uh, and you know, this is the sort of agreement between what the, the focus spot should have been and what it was actually measured to be. Um, so so we, we were able to actually do this and, and actually dial up desired spot sizes based on an on a input from a model to, uh, to tune the two mirror systems. Um, so it seems like it's all coming together and I'm actually pretty optimistic that I keep teasing Chambo that I want a slider on the beamline control where I can slide it from 50 nanometers to two microns and, uh, and, and it'll just work. And it seems like we're getting close to being able to, to, to do something like that. Um, here's the specification for the, for the vendors um, for the actual beamline design, the sort of shapes we're going to need to be able to achieve uh, with, with Deming's uh, vendor system. Um, our, our current test mirror is 200 millimeters long and we can almost bend it this much. So we're pretty confident that with a longer mirror, we're going to actually be able to push the bending a little bit further and get to the shapes we need. Um, we've actually ordered a second uh, set of, uh, of components to build a second mirror. So we don't have to be so worried about breaking it. And, uh, and we're gonna try to push it to, um, to the, the furthest possible extent and, and get a sense of where it'll break. Um, this is the specification for the for the, the bimorph mirrors, the hybrid bimorphs. That'll be uh, the second KB mirror pair. Um, so, so this is the sort of uh, like the greatest curvatures we're going to need to achieve for the smallest spot sizes. And uh, and you can see here, this is for uh, the red and blue curve here are for the different working distances. So the red I think is for the uh, the short working distance mode and the, the black here is for the longer working distance mode. And uh, what's pretty crazy about this is that the bender and uh, bimorph system combined probably can't achieve these these curvatures. So what we're going to have to do is actually polish a prefigure into the mirror. So, so even when the mirror is flat, it's going to be bent to, uh, or it's going to have a figure that, that sort of matches this blue curve here. So, so even with zero voltage and zero bending, we'll, we'll have some focusing. And I, I forget what this, uh, what this shape corresponds to. I think it corresponds to about a 300 nanometer focus or something like that. And then the, the bender and bimorph will, uh, will move us between the, uh, the red and the black line. So this is the spec for the horizontal mirror. This is the spec for the vertical focusing mirror. Uh, again, for the, for the two working distances. Um, and and it, you know we're we're currently collaborating with uh, Osaka University and JTEC to to really prove that something like this can can come into existence. Um, so that was kind of what I wanted to say about the optics, and I guess I got a few minutes left. Um, the the least developed uh, component of the beamline is actually the end station here. So again, we're going to be building a new hutch uh, down on the end of the sector here. So I thought I'd spend a little bit of time with the, the thing we know the least about. And, and I'm actually looking for a lot of advice here because, uh, because we're starting to get asked, a, I'm starting to get asked a lot of questions by our engineering team with regard to, to what we need to do to, to do the experiments. Um, so this is the sort of uh, conceptual layout that we, uh, we've had for, for a long time. It's been getting slowly more and more refined. Um, one thing we, we actually asked to do is to make a hutch that could extend out into the aisle a little bit to give us more space. Um, so from where our diffractometer will be to where the wall of the hutch will be, is, uh, is limited by the, the aisle of the APS. So people walk in this space here and we have this mezzanine, it's sort of a mechanical mezzanine up above the walking space. And I, I asked for special permission to extend our hutch out into this aisle a little bit to give us a little bit longer uh, detector arm. Um, we were allowed to go to just the edge of the posts that hold up the, uh, hold up the roof of the APS. And so we got basically an extra meter of, uh, of space here. Um, the plan is to have a control room on uh, just upstream of the hutch here where we can sit and work. Um, the control rooms are the first things that are being de-scoped in all the beam lines, so I, I hope we get to keep it. But anyway, we'll have a, a, small, uh, a small door here for people to go in and out, and we'll have a larger door on the inboard side here uh, for moving equipment in and out. Um, another uh, sort of feature of this is that we're going to have a, a sort of a tube on the end of the hutch here. Um, our original design had actually filled the whole sector with enclosure. And, uh, and I started to realize that, you know, some space outside of the hutch is as important as the space inside the hutch. But I wanted to keep this ability to, 
wow, that's kind of neat. I don't know how I did that. I wanted to keep this ability to do, uh, you know, sort of small angle scattering experiments, which are much with a much longer detector uh, distance. And uh, and Gary, who was an engineer at the time, said, well, why don't we just stick a tube um, off the end of the hutch that can be shielded, and you can have a track in there, and you can just stick a detector in there if you if you want to use it. So we're, we're still kind of keeping that design feature of the enclosure. Um, I wanted to point out that this is kind of a scary big space. Um, so, so this is where the, the hutch is going to go um, at the end of sector 34. And, uh, you know, this is the ceiling. This is about six meters um, uh, where these ventilation ducts are. So we're basically filling this whole space between this post and the end of the Lowy diffraction microscope with enclosure. And uh, I'm really trying to decide if I, if I really feel like we need this sort of bump out idea here and we really need all of this height. But the sort of five meter uh, detector arm distance was motivated by our sort of largest spot sizes. Um, sort of two micron beams need about a four, four meter detector distance with a sort of reasonable pixel size. And so that was sort of the motivation for this, uh, this sort of bump out here. Um, we, we haven't done final design on this enclosure yet. So there's still time to, to sort of rethink all of this. Um, I, I keep in sort of regular touch with uh, Garth Williams at Brookhaven, who's designing the uh, or leading the coherent diffraction imaging beamline there. And, uh, and we try to maintain a sort of overlap between what's going to be the capabilities of the two beam lines. And, and really, they're going to be, you know, solidly working on this uh, on this sort of bigger detector distance uh, capability. And, uh, and so this is all overlap. And so this idea of going with a detector to sort of four or five meters isn't really necessary from a, a, a you know, sort of capabilities point of view, because Brookhaven certainly capable of doing this, or will be capable of doing those kinds of experiments. So that, that's a place where I'm still trying to decide if I if I really want to keep pushing the, the size of the detector um, arm, mostly because it's also an engineering challenge um, to, to put a, a very large detector so far away. Uh, this is sort of our, our block diagram of the, of the instrument. So we're going to have the, the KV system here. Uh, this goniometer we're hoping can be a very high spec goniometer that will manipulate the sample. I'll say a little bit about that at the end. And then there's the sort of slits and shutter and uh, a wavefront sensor for tuning up the KB mirror system. This can be removable. We can move it in and out of the beam, you know, maybe attenuators. So, so this is the sort of, uh, sort of straw man that we're, we're starting to sort of assemble into a, a more realistic um, engineering um, sort of layout. Um, so Scott Izzo is the engineer that I've been working with on the sort of layout here. And, uh, and this is the sort of model he's been slowly developing. Um, so we, we, we're still kind of sticking to this idea of a sort of two circle detector arm, holding a big honking detector that can move from, you know, sort of a half meter out to five meter distance. Um, the sort of KB mirror drawing here is an actual engineering uh, component that's being developed to hold the, hold the bimorph, uh, the hybrid bimorph system. Um, so that's, that's relatively realistic. It still needs to be refined um, a bit. Uh, you can see there's no vacuum chamber in the drawing yet. And we have a slit and we have some sort of boxes here now that represent a, a wavefront sensor, perhaps a BPM, um, a high-speed shutter. And uh, when I say high-speed, I mean sort of millisecond. Um, and then an attenuator of some type. Um, and these things are slowly being, uh, you know, turned into more realistic, uh, more realistic elements. Um, and then the, the, the variable working distance will be accomplished by essentially moving the whole KB mirror system. Um, so a lot of people are probably familiar with this, this new instrument at the APS called the Velociprobe. And this was something that was developed by, uh, by Kurt Preissner, um, who's now our, our lead engineer at, at the Atomic Beamline. Um, or he was actually making stages out of granite. And so this thing is a, an air bearing stage that you can turn on the air, the granite floats on top of the uh, other piece and you can motor it left and right. And then there's a wedge system here to motor it up and down. And there's a gantry system here that you can also motor the optic forward and backward. Um, so, so these things are just starting to get picked up and used by the engineering staff at APS. In fact, the, the monochromator that was built for our, um, our Lowy diffraction uh, 
partner user proposal with Los Alamos was actually built on one of these granite stages. Um, so, you know, we're getting quite a bit of experience with them. So we're, we're kind of picturing something like this. We'll have a granite stage here that essentially moves the KV mirrors forward and backward by uh, 100 millimeters to, to change the, the working distance of the system. Um, uh, with our monochromometer, we've gotten a pretty good sense of the sort of angular stability of these granite stages. And um, it's actually surprisingly good. We can move the, the mono in and out of the beam and, and it's still you know, well within the rocking curve of, of the silicon 111 crystals. And you know, just a little bit of tune up and you get back on the peak. So these things are, are, are pretty good and they can probably be even better with a little bit of uh, um, careful thought that goes into the sort of angular reproducibility. Um, the, the wavefront sensor idea is something that's been actually developing quite a lot at APS. And, and we're starting to, to get to the point where we think this thing will work in, in pretty, pretty near real time, like sort of one hertz or maybe half hertz type frame rates where we'll be able to analyze the, get a fully analyzed wavefront out of the instrument um, and at, at sort of, you know, hertz kind of rates, um, which will make tuning up the, the mirror systems um, pretty, uh, pretty effortless, I think. If you can get that data directly into a, a control system that then feeds back to the shape of the mirrors, we should be able to tune up the, the Zoom KB system pretty well. We're gonna need two of these. We're gonna need one uh, between the mirrors and then one at the end downstream of the mirrors to tune up the, the second pair. And, uh, and so we're kind of still developing that, that sort of idea. These things are sort of a half meter long. Um, one thing I, I've been also looking at recently is, is the space upstream of the KB mirrors, you know, fitting all of these bits in to the, uh, to, to this space between the wall and where the KB mirror goes has been a little bit of a concern. Um, we originally only had about 1.4 uh, meters between the wall and the center of the diffractometer. And so I was starting to, to be a little bit concerned that as we started to move the center of the diffractometer downstream to get more space, how would that impact our, um, our sort of detector distances that we could achieve uh, given the you know the distance to the hutch walls and so I, I just recently did this little uh, little simulation where I moved the diffractometer downstream and computed the distance to all of the walls and uh, and you can see that as we move downstream from sort of the initial position that we had spec to about two meters downstream we only lose about 700 millimeters of, of sort of detector distance. And then there's an envelope here, you know, you can get the detector further away up here than you, you can over here. Yeah, this is really cool. I keep getting little lines. Um, so anyway, I, I wanted to do this just to, uh, to get a sense of what the impact was of, of moving this diffractometer downstream. And, and it works out to not be so bad. So I think the model that Scott is currently developing has the, uh, the sort of diffractometer moved downstream by a half meter or 750 millimeters or something like that. So it's like the second or third frame in this, this movie here. Um, so the goniometer is uh, something that we, we've made very slow progress on. And a lot of it is because we, uh, we suddenly started to worry about vibrations and, and the interaction between the detector arm and the sample. And, and it sort of put a freeze on the development of the, the goniometer. I've been showing this slide for a number of years now where I, I had this, this, this sort of picture in my head of a sort of inverted joystick where you'd have this highly polished cradle that you could tip and tilt by moving the, uh, the joystick on the bottom here. And, uh, and you could get a third axis Axis by rotating about this uh, sort of center axis of the joystick. And, and then as a, a sort of a point of, a, of a merit, I, I wanted to point out that the Hubble Space Telescope has a figure of 30 nanometers. So in principle, if you could polish this cradle to as uh, perfect a sphere as the Hubble Space Telescope mirror, you could have a, a 30 nanometer sphere of confusion, um, three axis goniometer. Um, again, I, I say that with a smile on my face because I, I know that that's, uh, that's a little bit overly simplified. But um, you, you know, we're starting to explore now with some uh, companies, you know, how, how far could you push the ability to, uh, to uh, you know, get a, a very high spec goniometer with a sphere of confusion that's approaching our, our X-ray spot sizes. If I want to do a, a scan of HKL from, you know, 1.5 to, to 4.5, 
I'm, I'm rotating my sample, you know, 20, 30, 40 degrees, and I'm trying to do that in a 50 nanometer x-ray beam, you, you sort of need a very high spec goniometer to do that. So we're, we're trying to explore how far we can push this and, uh, and, and trying to get some, uh, some engineering companies involved in, in, in perhaps, uh, you know, seeing, seeing what we can do. Um, when we started talking about this goniometer, we also started talking about vibration. If the, uh, if the, the, if the, the whole system was going to be vibrating on the scale of uh, 100 nanometers, it didn't make any sense to try to make a goniometer that had a 50 nanometer sphere of confusion. So, so Kurt Preissner started looking at, you know, just how, how good is even the floor at sector 34. Um, so, so that was one of the first measurements he did. Um, well, I guess this wasn't back in uh, January, he started looking at how, how good is the floor in the E station at 34 ID. So this is where the Laue microscope is. So it's just upstream of where our instrument's going to live. Um, Chambeau has a spec on the uh, KB mirror system of 10 nanoradians. And, and so we started to say, well, can the floor even do 10 nanoradians? And it looks like it barely can. So in the sort of five to uh, sort of five to 15 Hertz range here, you know, it's just making that 10 nanoradian spec, at least in two axes. Um, he has to redo the measurement to get the third axis um, out of the floor. Um, he also went to 34 IDC and he started doing measurements um, on the floor and on our diffractometer and on our optical table and on our sample stage and even on our detector arm as a function of moving our detector arm. So we're kind of curious how much does moving the detector at 34 IDC impact the sort of vibrations felt at the sample. And, and he actually found it wasn't zero. So as he moved the detector um, arm up and down and inboard and outboard, he started getting uh, sort of floor vibrations that were, you know, sort of, you know, 50 nanometer type vibrations on the floor that was amplified onto our, um, onto our uh, sample stack by, you know, the order of microns as the, the detector arm was moving. Um, it's well known that our optical table at our beamline is the worst optical table at the APS. It's, it's, it's normally vibrating a micrometer. Um, so, so to see it uh, go up by a, a factor of two wasn't, wasn't too surprising. Um, and I thought what was really neat was he actually measured on the detector arm as well. So as he was moving the detector arm up and down, he was looking at vibrations on the detector arm just just due to the motion and and he was finding you know quite large vibrations like 30 micron level vibrations and 60 micron level vibrations on our detector arm as as it was moving so that, that could actually impact this ability to sort of fly scan the detector if the, the detector is vibrating on the scale of the size of a pixel of the detector um, that, that might have an impact on our ability to do fly scans um, um, at the beam line. So, so it was an interesting sort of exercise, but at least we're, we're confident we can, well, we're, we're relatively confident we're going to be able to meet the spec of the sort of 10 nano reading instability of the, the KB system. And then the rest of the instrument's going to have to be designed uh, to try to, you know, really preserve that um, as, as we go forward. Um, I've just been asked by the project to start working out the, uh, the detector specification. Uh, the straw man detector that I told the engineers to, to use was an Iger 16M, mostly because it's really big and it's really heavy. Um, it's 55 kilograms, it's 400 millimeters in size. So it, it gave them a sort of straw man to say, okay, if I'm gonna try to move this thing from half a meter to five meters, and I'm gonna try to sweep a, a diffraction signal from you know 10 degrees to 40 degrees you know how am I going to be able to move something that big so it gives them something to at least uh, at least think about um, but we don't really have a, a detailed spec yet for the detector um, I got a slide here that that shows in a few seconds the kind of fluxes we're expecting and uh, and I'm a little bit worried about that. So I did a simulation similar to my little little gold crystal that I showed in the first few slides, but I simulated a sort of micron scale um, silicon, you know, nanowire. So sort of two microns long by, you know, 500 nanometers by 200 nanometers because that was a lot of atoms and it took a lot, long time to simulate the data set. I, uh, I generated that sort of simulated data set and I was, uh, getting like 30 million counts per second in the 004 Bragg peak. 
um, in that simulation. So, so we're talking about sort of 10 to the eight photons per second or more um, from, you know, maybe realistic samples um, in the sort of realistic estimate of the flux of the beam line. And, uh, and there's not a lot of detectors in the world that can swallow 10 to the eight photons per second continuously. You know, there's these AGIP technologies, there's the Jungfrau technology that's, that's coming into existence that, that has higher dynamic range. But it's um, a little bit scary that, you know, something like an Iger doesn't really behave linearly above 10 to the six photons per second. Um, so specification of the detector is, is going to be hard. Um, this was a slide I showed years ago where there's the MM pad that was developed at Cornell that can show, you know, sort of sustained 10 to the eight photon per second um, measurements. Um, Chambeau gave me this number originally that in our 50 nanometer spot, if we got the direct beam on the detector for something like a, a small angle tachography measurement, you could expect something like 10 to the 11 photons per uh, per second in the brightest pixels. Um, so, so those are, you know, pretty, and you know, it's, it's probably not going to be that high in reality, but it's still still going to be a very large number and, and specking a detector, I think is going to be quite difficult. Um, fortunately, the project is going to let us do that last. And so, you know, hopefully we'll just buy the best thing we can buy in, you know, 2021 or 2020, 2022 or 2023 when the APS comes into existence. Um, another question I was asked by the engineers was, well, what about the detector pose? And so we started thinking, you know, if, if this detector that we have at 34 IDC, if this sort of two circle goniometer, is going to impact the vibrations at, in the optics and sample. What are some other models we could use for, for moving the detector arm around? And, and you know, everybody's going to be pretty familiar now with the robot at Nanomax, where you can you know, basically position the detector anywhere you want. But um, what is the impact of the accuracy with which the detector is pointing at the sample, or, or what we've been calling the detector pose, how perpendicular it is to the incoming diffraction signal? Um, what is the impact of that and what specification do you need to be able to, you know, first of all, measure it and second of all, deal with it. If you go away from something like a two circle goniometer that we're all very familiar with. Um, so there's some other ideas, you know, like the robot arm or perhaps uh, uh, one circle like this with a stage stack that moves up and down and then a tip circle that, you know, rotates the detector to point at the sample or, or even something like this, which is sort of similar with to what they're developing at, uh, what Garth is doing at the CDI beam line at Brookhaven, where you have a sort of large arc where there's there's no motors near the sample. You you move the detector arm on this arc. You have a stack on the on this arm that can move forward and backward and up and down, and so you can you know basically move your detector around um, through through two circles in, in a scheme like this, where you know all the motors are, are very far away from the sample. I've been slowly starting to work on this, but it's actually quite a hard problem to, to work on. I, I wasn't really expecting it to be, to be so hard, but well, at least it's been hard for me. Um, so, so I can use extra utilities to, to say, okay, I'm, I'm putting a tip into my detector, a, a tilt into the detector about one axis, and I can simulate the, coherent diffraction pattern I would see as a function of that tilt angle, but then coming up with how that impacts the, uh, the image that you retrieve from the phase retrieval, and then coming up with a spec for how accurately you need to know the, the sort of pose error in the detector. Um, and, and the impact that that, that, that that error will have on the, on the image has been a little bit difficult, mostly because when I simulate data sets like this, you know, with something like a 4K by 4K detector, I'm really rapidly getting up to like six and 10 gigabyte coherent diffraction patterns. And even doing sort of phase retrieval on a 10 gigabyte data set, um, in 3D is, is, has been difficult. So I haven't gotten very far with, with coming up with a specification for this. So I'm kind of interested to, to hear what, what people have had, um, uh, you know, in their experience at, at other instruments and, 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 you know, Kurt's really bugging me about this because he really wants to know, um, sort of what we have to specify, uh, for our detector manipulator. And I guess that was about all I had planned to say and I just wanted to say thank you. And um, I figured because Argon paid so much for the slide template, I should use it. It's a little bit funny. Um, and uh, hopefully there's some, some good questions and discussion. Um, thank you so much, Ross. This was very interesting.
and then I, uh, I have already a couple of uh, people asking to make questions. So the first was Ian Robinson. Please, can you unmute yourself, Ian, and ask your first Hi, question? Hi, that, That's um, an incredible amount of, of work that's gone into all that. And uh, um, I, I wonder, you know, five years from now, how much of it's all going to be true. But uh, that's... Uh, you won't, you won't, it won't happen if you don't try. Um, <clears throat> the uh, I had a couple of questions about the optical design of the uh, the zoom system. Uh, mm -hmm. Firstly, a comment uh, that you you said it yourself, but the wavefront sensor uh, is is uh, indisputable. You you absolutely have to have that, and we've talked about this also for Garth. That mm -hmm. there's no way to to align anything like this unless you can put in something in between the optics and, and actually align each piece separately. So, so I, th I think you said that, but uh, uh, that does need to be emphasized because it's a much more complicated optical system. So my, I've got two related questions. One is why you've constrained the intermediate focus to be the same for the horizontal and the vertical, because that is a degree of freedom that would give you a lot more options, I would, I would think. Um, I, I, so, so you basically mean this prefigure, this blue curve? On, no, on I mean plots, you, you've decided. I think, I think without justifying it, that the, the vertical focus and the horizontal focus of the intermediate one, the one that moves, um, are both in the same place. Uh, I still don't think I understand what you mean. The one it's that basically moves. a KB. A zoom KB system is is a separate system in the horizontal and the vertical, so uh -huh, it, uh -huh. it's a horizontal pair and a vertical pair, uh -huh. um, and that intermediate focus could be different for the two, uh, in a different position for the two. Uh, oh, you it, mean you mean you mean for the for the first focus? Okay, yeah. So the 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 secondary source basically. Yeah. So this thing. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly, there's 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 no reason that you can't do them completely separately. So you could have a a two micron by fifty nanometer beam if you want. Right. Um, and, yeah. and and certainly that that's all that's all baked into the design. Yeah. yeah. So you you, you are you are actually allowing those folk those two foci to move separately because yeah, you can't yeah. put the vertical and the horizontal mirrors at the same place. You have to have them split. So it right, doesn't right. seem to make any sense to have that focus at the same place. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's, there's no reason you, you can't do any combination. So right. you can have in, in any, any spot size in any direction. Right. And uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That, that's so, certainly planned or baked into the system. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah. Uh, and then the, the second half of the question is, you, you never mentioned the word coherence in any of this. And I'm wondering uh, where your coherence aperture is in, in this design. Yeah, that's a good point. I never mentioned the word coherence. So, so here's the basic uh, beamline layout, and uh, and currently we have a slit um, after the monochromator before KB one. Okay. okay. Um, so so that'll be sort of our our coherence defining aperture, and all of the flux specifications that Shambo gives me is for a single coherent mode by his definition of a coherent mode, um, and so you can always give up on that a little bit and increase the uh, increase the flux. Okay. Um, we also have a slit before KB2, um, sort of a cleanup slit or a collimating slit, and uh, we haven't really thought too much about how these two slits are going to play against each other. Because if you remember Oleg Gang, he, um, uh, no, Oleg Juba here, mm -hmm. who's been advising Garth, um, says that it's it's bad to use slits for that because you um, you know, you get diffraction from them and it shows up in your, in your focus and so forth. But I guess that's, that's all been, um, um, thought through. Yeah, not really by us, mostly because we, we have some constraints. So there is a paper from Osaka mm. where they, uh, they explored what happens if you add an apodizing aperture, um, in between the two mirror sets. So, so mirror set one, you put an apodizing slit um, at the first focus, and then and then mirror two produces mm -hmm. the focus. And, and you can see in in simulation they got extremely clean um, beams. You know, here's the slit diffraction that's demagnified, yeah. um, and then and then they cleaned up all of that slit diffraction. And then they actually showed that it improved contrast and coherent diffraction. So they actually did a coherent diffraction measurement from a 
a little uh, grating or something like that and showed that the, the sort of uh, visibility of the fringes was improved by using this appetizing slit. Mm -hmm. um, we, you know, because we have uh, we have the 3D MN experiment between our two KB mirrors, we don't have a lot of freedom to do stuff between our, our KB mirror sets. And, uh, and, and, you know, those guys, they fight for every millimeter. They've, you know, they're not happy about having a beam pipe through their hutch. So, so it's been a bit of a challenge to, uh, you know, you know, convince them that, that they're going to be fine with like, you know, 500 millimeters of space at their end station here. But well, at least they won't have to have pumps or anything in there. I guess we, right. we fought that one out before. Yeah. yeah the yeah. other way around. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there was a question from Richard Sandberg about the maximum sample to detector distance. I think you talked about it. Yeah, uh, yeah, we discussed that at the end. Does he have any other comments about Yes, it? Richard, do you have any other? Maybe you can unmute yourself or write if you can't uh, talk. And, and I would just like to invite everybody else to um, either raise your hand in the chat or unmute yourself and ask. This is a very informal talk, so please profit of this uh, situation and ask Ross all, all the questions you, you would like. Um, I don't see any urgent question now. Hey, I have actually a question about the KB, Ross, uh, mm -hmm. and this always, um, uh, you know, is something that I also have to face at a certain point. Um, so the um, uh, bendable KB versus uh, fixed curvature KB. Um, I mean, th there is a there is a big risk of stability, isn't it? Um, uh, so the, the, the fixed curvature have, have this amazing quality of being stable over a long time. Now, I think Nanomax has proved this quite nicely. Uh -huh. uh, while on the, on the <clears throat> bendable, uh, especially if you want to add this active feedback, which may induce this, you know, hertz or subhertz instabilities. Uh, can you comment on this? Well, that, that was our motivation for adding the, the cap sensor array behind the mirror. So, so we can basically constantly watch the shape of the mirror and, uh, and, and look for drifts in the shape of the mirror. Um, so, so, so that's our motivation for that. So we basically, in the whole Zoom system, we're including an in-situ metrology. So, so for the benders, we have cap sensors on the back. And then for the for the bimorph, we're going to have this uh, interferometry array on the top surface that will be looking at um, looking at the optical surface of the of the mirror, um, because we, we know that we're going to have to to monitor the shapes of the mirrors and and probably maintain them at, at a relatively high rate. Um, well, we, we don't know how what kind of rate we're going to need to correct at yet, but uh, but we're going to have the ability to to you know, monitor the shape and, and maintain it um, at, at hopefully what's ever needed. Okay, there is a, a question from uh, Dina Scheifer about uh, energy scans. Do you consider using energy scans for BCDI? Yeah, certainly there's no reason not to. Um, we're, we're slowly starting to do it more at 34 IDC. Um, uh, so this, this sort of small offset monochromator idea um, should be very capable of doing energy scanning. Um, we've uh, already specified a slew rate for our, our undulator gap um, to, uh, to maintain the, uh, the, the synchronization between the, the undulator spectrum and the monochromator. And, uh, and it's going to be pretty fast, like the full range in something like five seconds or 10 seconds. Um, so, so we've... Uh, We've certainly been been uh, maintaining this idea that we want to be able to do to do energy scanning uh, coherent diffraction as well. Uh, uh, Dina is commenting again. Maybe um, have you have you also thought of the possibility of using automatic attenuator uh, the between the, the detector, detector, just in case you know during this. Um, uh, we're far more concerned about the sample than we are about the detector. So, so the attenuation is probably going to be to stop the sample from melting when you're putting 10 to the 12 photons on it. Um, then, then, then we are worried about the detector at this point. Um, actually, I started looking at at, at uh, attenuators a little bit because you know we don't 
currently we, we don't really use the attenuators in any way that's calibrated. We don't really care you know, about very specific attenuation. We just wanna make the beam dimmer because our sample is getting destroyed or because the detector is saturating. Um, so I've been looking a little bit at different ideas for attenuators and, and I was thinking of, you know, maybe exploring like a piece of silicon that's wedged and uh, the thin bit will be less attenuation and the thick bit will be more attenuation and we'll just motor that wedge of silicon through the beam uh, to adjust the attenuation. Uh, but, you know, again, it's, it's all tied to this sort of space we have upstream of our diffractometer. Um, I'm starting to, you know, worry about that and worry about, uh, you know, what goes into this space here. And, you know, this is a, this attenuator thing here, this box is actually an IDT attenuator block. And it's like, I think eight, eight foils or something like that. And it's half a meter long, you know, it really eats into the space we have um, upstream of our, our KB mirrors. So, so I'm starting to think about what's going into these gray boxes um, quite a bit now. Okay. Uh, I see that we have gone now 20 minutes after, let's say, the, the, the hour, which is good. We are still 30 people. Um, is there any other urgent questions from the audience? Because uh, I think that this ca the discussion can go on a long no, time forever, here. Forever. Um, I have a question. Go ahead, Stephen. I already asked one. Oh, thanks. Uh, so we're talking about 15 seconds for a data set, right? Uh, possibly. Um, what are you? Well, you're probably doing that now, right? So. Uh, not quite. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll tell you in a couple of weeks. Right? Um, the uh, the thing that is a bit concerning is the ability to scan the sample. Right? Have you thought about this at all? Yeah, yeah. Just the ability to scan sample. that fast, right? And yeah, and, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, so I was reading actually your fly scan paper um, yesterday, and. Uh, and starting to come up with ways to actually measure how much time we're currently spending on motor movement and detector uh, triggering. Um, so yeah, I mean, that, that's, all, that's all kind of baked into this sort of specification of the sample goniometer. And, uh, and, and I'm really getting concerned that we're not making any progress on this. Um, we, we, we made some progress late last year with developing a sort of a request for information document to send out to companies and say, here's what we'd like to do. You know, how close do you guys think you could come? And we were starting to set up meetings for, uh, you know, discussing this with different companies. And, uh, and it all sort of came to a crashing halt in the last uh, sort of, you know, nine months or something like that. So, so I really want to uh, get back to this. And, uh, and I think now that we have a better handle on things like, you know, the vibrations of the floor and the beam line and, and the sort of spec of the detector arm that we're, uh, we're going to be looking at, we can start, you know, approaching the sort of specification of a goniometer with a little bit more sort of confidence and uh and start talking to companies about this but you're right i mean scanning a sample very fast and then perhaps fly scanning and continuously measuring and uh, uh it's all it's all stuff that's you know slowly being developed you know you guys are making progress on it um and and we're gonna start you know working on it at a certainly you know different scale than you guys but uh but it's all it's all got to be solved and, and i think we're making progress on it Okay. okay, thank you. Well, before going ahead, maybe with a more informal discussion, I would like just to uh, uh, close officially this session. Uh, thank Ross enormously for this uh, contribution and then uh, remind that actually we are now opening for more beam lines. So you, uh, in, a, in, a week time, in a couple of weeks time, I think it's um, uh, Stephen who is going, is going to give a uh, talk on uh, ID1 at the SRF. There, there is also on the line NSLS2 and Soleil and I'm in contact with more scientists. So please keep, uh, keep tuned and the program is going to be updated. Uh, we 